Hey, what's going on guys? And in today's video, we're going to be answering a reader's question regarding digoxin and the mechanism of action in atrial fibrillation. Now, before we get into the question, I want to geek out for just one second. So if you bear with me for 30 seconds, I just want to say how excited I am, how happy I am. I was able to get the new MacBook Pro. I thought that because I'm going to be doing these videos um, more frequently, especially in the month of February, I needed something with a little bit more power. And I'm, I'm a huge Apple guy. Uh, I'm a huge Apple product kind of guy. So very excited to be playing around with this. So much more powerful. My last MacBook was, I don't know, six, seven years old. So it was definitely time for an upgrade, um, especially when working on these videos. So that's my 20 second geek out moment. Now, today we're going to be answering a question regarding digoxin. And this is going to be from James. He's one of the, uh, one of our readers. And his question is specifically regarding its mechanism of action with atrial fibrillation. So this is his question. He asks, hi, Andrew. Thanks for your continued efforts in educating the medical practitioners you reach in this forum. One question relating to your digoxin presentation. Uh, this is an email that I sent out maybe a week or two ago discussing the mechanism of action, but I focused more on its CHF effects, on its positive inotropic effect. And he said, you describe the digoxin's inotropic activity, but how does it work in atrial fibrillation when this is used? So a couple of things that I first want to talk about before getting into the mechanism of action with digoxin. Digoxin is by no means used first line. Digoxin is used as an adjunctive medication when the first line therapies don't work. So first line therapies, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. This is going to be first line. Now, when we're discussing calcium channel blockers, we're talking about the non-dihydropyridines, verapamil, diltiazem. Verapamil, diltiazem, beta blockers. These are going to be first line medications. These, this, these are the medications we're going to be using for rate control. When we rate control patients with atrial fibrillation, we're separating them into two types of, uh, or into two subsets, I should say. Those that are asymptomatic and those that are symptomatic. The asymptomatic patients, right? The patients who don't have chest pain, who don't have shortness of breath, the patients who feel just fine but have atrial fibrillation, we can rate control those patients to less than 110, less than 110 beats per minute. The patients that are symptomatic, they do have symptoms, we want to rate control these patients to less than 85 beats per minute. So very quickly, first line, atrial fibrillation, rate control, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, specifically verapamil diltiazem. Second, we separate by symptomatic versus asymptomatic. The symptomatic patients, we are rate controlling to less than 85. The asymptomatic, I feel just great, but I have atrial fibrillation. We're going less than 110 beats per minute. Now, if these medications fail to rate control or we have a comorbidity and we're going to be using digoxin anyway for congestive heart failure, then we can consider digoxin for a control, for atrial fibrillation rate control, right? Now, very quickly, how does digoxin work? Remember, digoxin acts on the sodium potassium ATPase pump, right? When it acts on this pump, we have a rise in intracellular sodium, and then we have the sodium calcium exchanger. The sodium calcium exchanger, when we have a rise in sodium, we then have a rise in calcium, right? What happens when we have a rise in calcium? we have depolarization of the myocytes of the pacemaker in the AV node. We have prolongation of this action potential that occurs in the myocardial cells. So what are we doing? We're increasing the length of the action potential and slowing down depolarization of these pacemaker cells, of these pacemaker cells down the AV node and reducing ventricular rate. Digoxin also works in the setting by inhibiting AV node conduction via vagal tone. This means that when we have more sympathetic tone, for example, when we're exercising, we're running, lifting weights, digoxin is not going to be as effective. So it's affecting or it's uh, it's affecting the AV node via vagal tone. It's also increasing the action potential. It's increasing or it's uh, prolonging the depolarization of the pacemaker cells in the AV node. So it's slowing down conduction via the AV node. Very important to note though, digoxin only works for rate control. It slows the heart down, 
but it cannot convert to sinus rhythm. It, ha it will do nothing for the actual rhythm, right? It's not getting rid of atrial fibrillation. We're simply using it to rate control. With that said, the majority of patients are still going to need a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. The majority of patients will not be adequately rate controlled with the joxin alone, right? So very quickly, we have the sodium potassium ATPase. We have an intra, we have a rise in intracellular sodium. This then causes an, a rise in intracellular calcium. This intracellular calcium causes contractions. This is how it's beneficial in CHF because we have increased contractions. We have a positive inotropic effect. It allows the heart to pump more. And by more, I simply mean it doesn't mean it pumps faster. It increases the force of the contractions. This is beneficial in symptoms only does not decrease mortality. And actually, there have been some studies when we are using digoxin for atrial fibrillation that shows that we can have increased mortality in patients. Now, this is controversial. Some studies say, yes, there might be an increase, um, increased incidence of mortality when used for atrial fibrillation. Some studies say no. The studies that do indicate that there's a possible increase in mortality, the mechanism is completely unclear. So this is controversial. It might be related, I was doing some reading, it might be related to the increased um, serum levels of digoxin, but it's unclear. Speaking of serum levels of digoxin, the digoxin level does not correlate to the ventricular rate. So we don't want to use serum digoxin levels as a way to measure titration for atrial fibrillation, right? We don't want to do that. The only reason or the only um, benefit for measuring serum digoxin levels is to avoid toxicity. So if we have very, very low serum digoxin levels and we're not adequately rate controlled, then we can consider increasing the rate because we know we're not at an increased risk for dig toxicity. Now, what can be a sign of digoxin toxicity? When we have a junctional rhythm. So when we have these periodic junctional rhythms, this can be an indication that we have digoxin toxicity. One little caveat though, before I let you go is a junctional escape beat, right? So if we have an escape beat, a junctional escape beat, this is normal. And this is often seen in patients with digoxin. This does not mean we have toxicity. It's when we have more than an escape beat, now we have a junctional rhythm. This is an indication that we might have dig toxicity. So I hope this makes it clear. It does the same. Increases sodium, increases calcium, and this is going to prolong the action potential depolarization, which is going to slow the heart down. It also acts via vagal tone. So this also means that if the patient is exercising, the joxins probably not going to be all that useful. So I hope this was beneficial. Like I said, starting in February, we're going to be doing these videos Monday through Friday. If you have any questions for me, if you like clarification, advice, um, you know, I get emails regarding uh, finding jobs, things of that nature, anything at all. Send an email to andrew at physicianassistantboards.com. More than happy to answer any questions. I'm here to help however I can. You can also check out the website, physicianassistantboards.com, where I try and post different articles, different videos, podcasts. So anyway, this concludes today's episode. This will be live tomorrow, which will be January 20th. I hope everyone had a great new year. Until next time. Have a great day.